if I can. Okay, um, I can be heard, I think. Um, managing large scale, large numbers of capture agents, uh, as you have heard and seen the boxes in our storeroom in uh, Stuart's presentation. I, unfortunately, I wanted to get this slide in as well in, in my presentation, but the, the, I got, didn't get the image at the right time. So not a, it, it won't be in. And it's not that as important. You can have a look. It was on some Twitter feed on some point a few a few weeks, or is it months by now ago? So yeah, um, what am I uh, talking about? Our setup uh, uh, has been explained quite a lot. It's a capture agent uh, based on Ubuntu uh, LTS 12.04. That's the basic system. That's what we have at the moment in these 12 locations. Uh, it has a Linux kernel version, 3. Point something. Uh, uh, the, the point something is on purpose there because it is uh, very non-uniform across the, the 12 machines uh, as they were installed in uh, manually and on several days. And for anyone who has experience with Ubuntu, they, they can change uh, their kernel version within uh, two weeks, three times. Um, so, um, which isn't actually a, a big problem because the software will deal with it, except that you end up with uh, 12 machines, which are slightly, ever so slightly differently uh, and have ever so slightly different uh, configurations. They all have a Blackmagic Intensity Pro card uh, by now. That has changed from uh, ha about half of them having an Epifan card in the beginning and uh, being changed over. They all have the now the Kramer scaler um, and the uh, they all start automatically on power re on resuming power and. Uh, automatically start Gallicaster. I will show that in a minute, uh, uh, basically connecting my presentation through the uh, Kramer scaler uh, into the capture agent and you'll see the uh, Gallicaster screen. And I will actually, uh, once we uh, do that, I will pull the power of the machine so you can see the time it takes from the machine being shut down to the machine being back up as uh, we were, uh, uh, mildly spoken, ex absolutely impressed how fast it is to have uh, Gallicast up and running again. So, and they already, uh, they also automatically start up a VNC server so we can connect to the thing. What's that? Yeah, that's some Windows thing. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, um, so if, if the virtual machine shuts down for installing updates, uh, we can wait uh, another two hours for the machine to come back up. Um, so uh, the current installation, as I said, 12 Gallicaster capture agents across campus. Uh, they were installed using uh, bash scripts to uh, do all the nonsense tasks. So we set down in the beginning uh, to create at least some shell scripts uh, because uh, the first attempt we did uh, handish installing all these uh, black magic drivers by hand, installing uh, extra packages by hand, installing Gallicaster by hand. So a single machine took uh, about a day to, to get off the ground. Um, as we knew that wouldn't work uh, in the scale of 10, uh, basically, we copied the commands together into a shell script and ran them in that way. Yeah, that's what ended up doing the uh, Ubuntu installation, pushing a uh, USB memory stick in uh, uh, to the front of the machine, uh, waiting till it boots from it and installs uh, the uh, standard Ubuntu installation. Um, 
One of the annoying bits on that was uh, the standard Ubuntu installation has uh, screwed up our monitor setting. So you were half blindly typing your username, password, and uh, uh, trying to set up some time zone and whatever issues. Um, and once you've done that, uh, this thing went away. Half an hour later, it was uh, in a pre-state of uh, having an oper operating system on. And then we went on uh, start our shell scripts, which ran another half an hour, automatically rebooted in, be in between. Uh, then we, you ran another shell script uh, to set up IP address, uh, name, and so on. And the result was you had a finally working Gallicaster unit. Um, so in with the shell scripts, we had a turnaround time of about two hours to from uh, unpacking the, the uh, capture agent from its box, uh, installing the capture card, and uh, until it, somebody could take it to the lecture theater uh, and it would work. Um, there is the other thing we developed on that uh, basis uh, was uh, monitoring through VNC. So the VNC server was installed at some point. Um, we originally used the X11 VNC server uh, until we noticed this, that this is a very a dubious piece of software uh, and uh, it falls actually over and when it falls over it takes down X. Sometimes it takes it down which isn't that bad in first place because you basically can uh, uh, get a reboot signal through SSH to the machine. Uh, what is much worse if it gets the machine into a uh, stuck solid state uh, where you actually have one choice and that is pressing the power button. Unfortunately, the power button is about uh, half a kilometer down the road. Um, and the next person to press the power button is a phone call away, but most likely on a different duty in a different building at that, that moment in time. And we had uh, turnaround times of up to three days. Um, and that was not not to blame anyone, but they were busy as well, and uh, their priority was everywhere, but not our capture agent. It was just another nuisance box in the room uh, they need to suddenly deal with, uh, which they didn't have to before. So um, you understand they are not weren't that, ple that pleased to be sent out on errands just to re restart the machines. So uh, on that one, we actually created a bunch of cron jobs which tried to uh, monitor the box internally. Um, that was basically looking is uh, the Python process or the Python Gallicaster process still running. If not, then uh, uh, you might better get it back up. Uh, and is uh, uh, the uh, clock still changing? Is the is the Gallicaster process uh, still writing something to the logs? Uh, because the uh, Gallicaster has an has a heartbeat which writes every uh, half th every second. No, no. Every, every, several times a minute. Several times a minute, uh, it writes back to the uh, to its log. Yes, I'm still alive. I'm I'm still I'm still fine. If that doesn't happen for two minutes, uh, you might want to consider uh, killing the process and restarting uh, Gallicaster. Um, these, these scripts uh, work uh, reasonably well, take a bit of load, but that's not a, not a serious issue on an i3 setup as we have. Uh, it's not the end of the world and it's not, uh, big, it's not big science doing that, it's just... Um, it needs to be done on the box itself because you might not have any connection to the box uh, uh, anymore because something has shot across. Uh, we also did uh, for the uh, capture agent monitor, we took the screenshots on the box, uh, which is placed on a web server on the box itself. So an external tool can connect to the uh, uh, capture agent and pull the uh, screenshot straight from the from the capture agent's uh, web server. Um, again, that works uh, until you lose your network connection, 
and uh, we used a VNC snapshot on the X11 uh, VNC server and every single snapshot which was about uh, 10 a minute uh, was creating a new VNC connection to the local VNC server and not closing it. And that was what in the end hung the uh, uh, capture agent because on some point you run out of file handles. Um, which we only found out uh, once the machines were hanging and uh, the only change was that we started the X11 VNC server. So the situation now we have uh, 12 capture agents in the wild. Uh, I call it in the wild because you have all the uh, strange uh, environmental issues uh, which we, as Stuart described, didn't have in our nice uh, office uh, desk. Just plug it in, networking works, everything works. Um, out there, you never know what, what you find, how warm it is, how close it is, how much space you have how many people you have who actually uh, intend on uh, uh, cleaning the room and pulling the power. Uh, and all these sort of things, uh, strange side issues. And uh, with the 12 machines out there, they have different versions on the, of the kernel, uh, uh, different update stages, uh, different levels of Gallicaster patching, different levels of operating system patching, different levels of uh, tools, because as we basically push the, all the changes out manually, uh, even with 12 machines, on some point, uh, even if it's done by one person, on some point you don't know which machine have I done now and which machine is still to do. Yes, you can do checklists, uh, but uh, if you do 12 in, uh, in two hours, uh, there is, you are certain to miss one out. Have, uh, am I doing the tick in the beginning of my, my task, or am I doing it in the end? Um, it's a concentration thing. Keeping, and so the short, short answer to that one, keeping a small number of machines in sync, even a small number like 12, is a, an absolute nightmare if you try to do it manually. Now, having 12, okay, I, I can deal with that. Uh, I can manage them. Oh, and James and I, we work very well together. So uh, each five, each six, or um, uh, I do them today, you do them tomorrow. Uh, it works perfectly. But moving that to 100, uh, no, thank you. Uh, um, it's just... Uh, you need to think uh, very thoroughly. And uh, the challenge is install 100 machines from a box as you get, can buy in your next, next local store, basically, with all the uh, nonsense paperwork, CDs, uh, uh, power cables, two network aerials, um, power supply, all in the box, nicely packaged, all... To, to make it safe, have a bit of uh, st styrofoam around it, have a bit of uh, plastic uh, bag around every single item, have uh, something as stupid as uh, four feet, which you can actually stick on the box to uh, have it secured from vibration. It all needs to be done. And uh, 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 I think Stuart had a big picture of the boxes what he didn't have is the big picture of one of those, box, uh, one of those boxes full with all sorts of junk. Uh, because uh, in the, the uh, standard box was all this stuff. And then we had a uh, standard consumer black magic card box. Most of you will have seen one. In there is the card, there is a CD, there is uh, three bags with cables, there is... Um, and all we are actually interested in is the Blackmagic card. Everything else goes st straight to landfill or if we are nice to the environment, to recycling. Um, yeah. And the next thing, installing 100 boxes, yeah, it can be done. It's, uh, it's a tedious task. Uh, and we had to configure the BIOS. We had to... Uh, open the boxes twice because we needed to to get in order to get an IP address for them uh, we needed to provide the MAC address now how do you get to the MAC address except uh, unpacking the box there's no way uh, so they were installed 
uh, or they're opened up, put, uh, put on, the st uh, on the stack like this. Um, five at a time, we have our own uh, NAT uh, router in there. We have a KVM, which is underneath there. Uh, and all in one monitor, and five at a time in a stack, uh, all go on uh, in, in one, at one time, and then uh, uh, get them installed. So, managing them, uh, updating machines needs to be done uh, with 100 machines. You don't want to have the odd one out which has a different configuration. That's an absolute impossibility because you don't know which one was the odd one out. Uh, you will have, we will have enough uh, trouble with the odd one out which is falling over because uh, it doesn't, uh, you will have a dodgy one in a, hun a batch of 100. We don't, we don't ask uh, if, we only ask which one is it. Um, that's, that's normal. And anybody who uh, uh, uses bigger clusters of uh, machines will know that uh, you have to expect hardware failure. Um, so maintaining them, keeping them in sync, updating machines, uh, having a safe upgrade strategy, because again, uh, you want to, uh, these pu uh, tools we, I'll introduce, uh, such as Ansible, uh, Puppet, or you, you uh, name them, they all have one big disadvantage. They can all manage 100 machines, but if you make a mistake, they all take all 100 machines out at the same time. So it's great that you can uh, actually uh, fix 100 machines at a time, but you really want to be sure that your fix is actually fixing rather than breaking. Uh, other advantage, if you don't uh, uh, kill your network connection, the same way that, that just killed the, the thing uh, can in the next minute fix the whole thing again. So that's the positive side. But I have actually successfully managed to do my first configuration of five boxes, uh, doing networking, uh, creating deny hosts. Unfortunately, I made it the, did it the wrong way around. So I put the, uh, first the host.deny in and wanted to do the host.allow afterwards. Hmm, just a slight problem. I lost my SSH connection by doing the first host.deny. So happens. That's, uh, that's why you do it on five machines uh, where you can basically go through uh, manually and uh, correct your nonsense uh, locally uh, before you roll them out completely. Um, yeah, and providing a homogeneous user experience. That's the next uh, important thing. The user doesn't care, doesn't want to care, and shouldn't need to care uh, what is going, in the, uh, going on in the background. That's what uh, Stuart explained with the podcast producer. The user didn't want to know that we change everything in the background. And the sh user shouldn't have to care about that. As long as the, the user is getting what he was getting uh, half an hour ago uh, in the lecture theater three meters away, um, he will be happy. So, and that is the, the main thing. So. Let's com come to the tools we are using. Um, first thing, uh, if you want to install uh, a ma l large number of uh, systems, uh, look intensive, intensively at, uh, at network booting. Uh, so we, uh, Jaime has, has done uh, operations training uh, at our place, and one of the extras he provided us with was a coupler server. Uh, which does PXE booting and uh, could actually send data down to, uh, down to the capture agents and create uh, a box uh, uh, as you would want to expect. Uh, the next thing, which is a very interesting concept, uh, is uh, if you use Red Hat based things, it's Kickstart. If you use uh, Debian Ubuntu-based things, uh, it's the same thing called preceding. Uh, create your operating system install disk so that you don't have any user interaction. What you want to do is plug the machine into the wall and press a button, and from that point onwards, it goes into network boot, 
And what falls out at the end is a working operating system uh, which has network connectivity. With that, you basically, uh, uh, we managed our highest throughput day uh, on installing these capture agents was 25, uh, done by a single person uh, uh, with some help getting the Blackmagic card into the box. Uh, but even that, uh, in the end, the uh, installation of the base operating system and then the Ansible configuration down to uh, the capture agent was taking about as long as it took uh, uh, to create five new boxes with a Blackmagic card in there. So, um, uh, I will explain our pre-seed management. I have, uh, um, for the people who are taking frantic pictures, uh, I'm very happy for anyone to have the PowerPoint slides. Uh, I don't think there's any secrets in there. Uh, passwords I've taken out, so... <laughs> uh, they've only gone out because uh, the MD5 string of the password was just too long. <laughs> it doesn't fit on the screen. Um, the next step we did uh, with the Ubuntu preceding, we got to a running Ubuntu system uh, with uh, SSH enabled uh, and to be able to run Ansible on the uh, local machines. Uh, by the way, one of the tools which are very helpful for these sort of generation of these setups is uh, Vagrant. Uh, all our configuration management stuff, uh, the, all the Ansible stuff has been tested before it went onto the uh, hardware boxes. Uh, I've run it on four uh, Vagrant uh, virtual machines on my laptop and uh, distributed this stuff across there. Because in the worst case, if everything goes horribly wrong, you just dump the uh, virtual machine and create a new one. Um, so the uh, Ansible, with the Ansible configuration management, um, again, I have. I am not going into fine details of that. But if you, anybody is interested in our Ansible con, uh, uh, scripts, I'm happy to uh, send them out. Uh, again, the passwords will be removed by that. Uh, but there is no. I don't see there any major IPR in there which uh, could do any harm. Um, it is a bit of a learning curve. Uh, our choice of Ansible was driven by uh, Jaime, uh, but the, uh, I think looking at it afterwards, we would have possibly ended up, if we had known a Puppet Ansible and Chef, we would have uh, ended up with Ansible most likely anyway. looks like a Monty Python yeah, sketch. So one of, one of the reasons um, Hamie mainly sort of suggested using Ansible was, um, he, was he came over for four days and he said he would have, if we did Chef or Puppet, we would have spent four days learning Chef and Puppet. Whereas Ansible, we went for the principles and started, did, did a couple of examples and we were into the documentation. We were running our own uh, Ansible playbooks within a couple of hours kind of thing. So it, you can get up and going very quickly with it. If you've not, you, me and Tobias had not done configuration management before, done very little DevOps before, but we were, we were able to get up and running with that kind of thing uh, very easily kind of thing. So it's, it's got a very low um, entry boundary kind of thing, yeah. unlike Chef and Puppet. Yes, the uh, entry level was pretty simple. Uh, you bang your head against uh, some of the Ansible modules very soon because uh, they don't quite do what they are saying or they don't quite do it in the way uh, the previous uh, release has done. So we actually moved from 1.2 uh, to 1.22 and some of the configurations have slightly changed. So um, some escaping was slightly different. But that's, that's the things you will have with any system uh, uh, around and who knows better than, than the Matterhorn community uh, that documentation might not be 
always what, uh, what it should. And the Ansible documentation is pretty good, except they, it's completely example driven. And if your uh, use case isn't quite what uh, the examples show, you can get into real trouble finding any, any other information. Um, that happened to me with uh, the uh, deny host configuration stuff. Um, the configuration management, one of the important things is uh, to make it uh, safe to run several times, even potency. So whenever you uh, uh, write your configuration management, make sure that it does not uh, worry too much about what the state before was. Uh, define what your result state should be and uh, make sure uh, the input data, yes, you will need to look at your input files. So I need to change network configuration. I need to create a deny hosts file which has all in and I need to a, create a host.allow file which has the local IP address, uh, the local net, uh, the uh, public network and the, the private network in there. So uh, you need to make sure that you haven't got this thing in there uh, 15 times or 16 times and forever, whenever you uh, create another one uh, or run it again, uh, you have another entry of your public network in your host.allow um, which um, would certainly work, but your host that allow will very soon be uh, so big that you uh, uh, run into trouble editing it. Uh, so whenever you create something, overwrite settings in the files rather than trying to add to files. Um, that means you will know from your Ansible, document, uh, Ansible script, you will know uh, once that point is over, it, is, it will have that state, no matter what it, what it was before. Um, this is, becomes important because uh, by doing these sort of things, you can actually run the configuration management uh, three times, four times. Whenever one of the five machines fails in their configuration management, you just run the script on all five again. And on some point, you get to the point that it just goes through. And uh, that's when you basically, say, uh, basically can say, that's it. All five succeeded. Have all the configuration steps have, have been passed. And that's it. Why could the configuration management fail? It goes via the network. Networking is, uh, is always an issue. If you have a DHCP assigned network from a local router, uh, and have a reboot in your uh, uh, scheduled, you might get the same uh, IP address from the router, you might not. So that basically kicks the thing uh, back into, yeah, I can't get a connection. So, and these sort of things do happen, or it skipped one step, uh, one of our steps in the configuration management is removing the uh, 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 one, of, one uh, Linux kernel and installing another one. Once you have done that, you need to reboot because otherwise uh, your Blackmagic configuration installation will be to the wrong, wrong kernel. So these sort of things do happen. And you, in the moment you have a reboot in, uh, in your configuration management steps, uh, likelihood is that you don't have the, net, uh, the same IP address. And it, it always happens to one of the five machines. It's very seldom that it happens to all of them. So um, you have one machine which doesn't play, and then you try again. So um, back from the uh, uh, configuration management to the, to the preceding, yes, I'm throwing quite a lot of code uh, up here. Uh, it's about four uh, pages of precede code. Um, I basically have the uh, main tasks which are done in this code. It all looks a bit cryptic, that's Debian for you. Uh, you can uh, set uh, the, we are setting up a sort of locale and it does it for about uh, uh, half the machine. 
Uh, if anybody knows the uh, Ubuntu way well enough to tell me how I set the full locale uh, in a preceding script, I'm very grateful. I haven't managed, so I put up this uh, when I have to go in from uh, remote uh, to a console in, in the X. Uh, I will have to put up with an American keyboard. It's not the end of the world. It's annoying, but it's not the end of the world. Um, setting up the keyboard, again, that's the attempt. Um, yeah, I know, I, I know Andy will say, uh, what's the problem with the American keyboard? Uh, <laughs> the problem is, it's just ever so slightly different from the British. <laughs> um, set up gen uh, general networking, um, basically define your uh, uh, host name. Uh, in our first step, all our machines have a fixed host name, have a fixed username, uh, uh, have all these set data set. Um, they all have the same uh, password to get in. Uh, that can later be changed in the uh, configuration management system. Uh, so, but we need some uh, common ground to start off from and then set the, what we need defined uh, separately, we can set uh, in the uh, Ansible definitions. Uh, we set up the Ubuntu installation mirror, so the machines then go out to install the base system from. Uh, have a time, time zone and time service set up. Uh, time service is one of the important things because uh, the capture agents uh, use time and it would be very helpful if they use the same time or at least a similar time uh, to the uh, Matterhorn. Um, I'm talking about similar time because uh, it might happen that some of our capture agents go into other time zones, but at least the, uh, the minutes and seconds are identical and that, that can do quite a lot of uh, positive things. We don't quite know how we manage the time, time zone issues uh, properly uh, in scheduling, but that, that's basically down to later. Um, that's that's uh, not the installation. At the top is actually uh, the wrong thing. That's setting up the hard disk and uh, uh, partitioning. We all only use one partition. The whole disk is one partition. Everything goes into a big block and then uh, we have a maximum amount of free space to store our data on the capture agent before it's ingested to Matterhorn. We set up the default user, and here you see the my password is a long MD5 string. Um, and we set up uh, automatic login, so the capture agent comes up, logs in, starts up a galley caster. That's our workflow. Uh, as our box is somewhere in a uh, uh, shelf without monitor, without keyboard, without uh, anything in a back either in a projection room or in the uh, cupboard under the desk. Uh, that's the best way of doing that. And we set up the default user that's still there. Um, and then we set up uh, the package selection for a default desktop. Uh, it is all Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu uh, the smaller, smaller version of uh, uh, Ubuntu, and it sets up remote access. And that's basically all it is. And then I have a late command to set up the uh, uh, SSH key for the root user so we can uh, remotely log in. Uh, and that's all the preceding needed for 90% uh, of the machines not needing any user interaction. And the other ones uh, who fail on that one uh, get a reboot and uh, try again. So again, Final result is the beautiful blue Lubuntu screen uh, on uh, four out of five machines. The fifth machine is somewhere in a command command prompt uh, because it didn't get uh, reboot to the to the right state. Uh, that was at least the, the my usual result. Um, one issue might be that our network port only allows. Uh, uh, six uh, different MAC addresses at, at any one time to, to run, and I had seven machines. Um, 
Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, that's, but that's internal networking. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the things uh, you need to get cleared if you do mass deployment, mass installation. What's your basic network infrastructure doing once you put a router in there? Configuration management. Uh, Ansible uses standard SSH access. Um, I was going to show. Uh, uh, we are using S tools VirtualBox. So I have here uh, in, uh, overall four uh, capture agent uh, images. Uh, which have been created by Vagrant. Um, I'm not starting them through Vagrant, uh, just to actually see once we start them. I'm starting them through uh, the VirtualBox monitor system, and it should. It should come up on some point. Uh, um, oh, oh, fine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if there are questions. Um, I was just uh, wondering, you said you ditched the, the X11 VNC server. We use, uh, uh, we went to Vino. Vino, okay. Yeah. The default, yeah. And another one, um, is there no existing PXC environment on, in your... Um, if you want to uh, get a bunch of angry people in IT services, uh, you mention network booting. <laughs> they don't like that. Oh, they, they, they would love having network booting, but we have uh, networking issues uh, which uh, make network booting reasonably complicated. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking when someone else is introducing another PXC environment, it could be... Um, we are not uh, PXE booting the capture agents in the deployment. We are okay. only PXE booting the install. Yeah, okay, okay. So, so you're installing uh, within your we office? In, we install in our office. Uh, the, our uh, PXE server is in the same uh, rooted environment, so it's completely independent. It's a, a local, local network, uh, local to basically the, the desk. Uh, on this uh, big picture, you would see somewhere as well a network interface. So I've just heard I only have another five minutes. So um, basically, running Ansible, uh, Ansible uses SSH access. Uh, it is configured uh, to do different things on different machines, so we can actually define by the IP address uh, we define the host name uh, uh, and send out the new IP address once it's going into the theaters, uh, will be uh, sent to the uh, boxes. So we have a local IP which we get from our uh, DHCP server on the, on the routing, uh, routed environment and that will be set into Ansible configuration management file in the host file and from there uh, the real thing will be sent out uh, to the capture agent. And as I just have so, much, so limited time, uh, once the configuration management went through, you end up with your galley caster working in a box. And I'll show the live thing in a minute. So uh, all machines, the, the main point of the Ansible is we basically just need to change the host file uh, to include the uh, uh, addr addresses in the lecture theaters, and we can send then, without actually moving from our desk, we can send a new configuration to all machines which are in the wild, rather than looking at uh, going down to lecture theater uh, at the end of the road or in the other part of the, of the city. Um, so, as I said before, make sure it's safe to change 
make sure you have tested on uh, several machines before you send anything into the big picture because some of the uh, configurations are a bit uh, questionable and it needs to be, uh, if you do uh, dangerous things like closing your uh, remote access, then make sure that you are uh, doing it in, again, a very safe way. So open up first and close then. Um, if you run this, you basically get a vast amounts of waffle out of the uh, uh, on the screen, and the final final interesting thing is basically uh, it's done the five machines as you can barely see here, uh, and state is okay. Uh, so much has changed. So uh, it hasn't been reached. If there's a machine which wasn't reached, that will get read. If some you have uh, uh, warning states, uh, or that includes changes made on machines. They will be yellow, and they will be yellow in the in the text. And you have uh, failed states. I'm happy to sh demonstrate the running of Ansible on my local virtual machine environment, so you can have a look what is what what it's going. But I think uh, that's. Uh, uh, going overboard here. Uh, what do we do in the installation? We remove the PAE kernel because Blackmagic does not play with PAE. Neither does the Epifan, I have to say. Um, uh, we install a 3.5 kernel on the, on the system because the 3.2 kernel uh, decides to hang from time to time. Um, we had less problem with 3.5, but again, we don't quite know. Um, Install the capture agent installation and patching. Uh, we have done a few extra things on Gallicaster, which uh, are some patches which we uh, basically patch in life during the configuration management. We install the capture cards and we configure the capture agent. Uh, what's its domain name? What uh, profile is it using? And so on. And the result is a running capture agent and our verification is, the, is a wildlife video which is running on a loop on a different system uh, externally. One thing, uh, monitoring capture agents, that's the next interesting thing. Uh, you have seen the uh, and, and tools for that. One of the big tools is VirtualBox and, and Vagrant to create your test environment before you go on to uh, hardware. It's the cheapest way of doing things. Uh, there is so many things you can't test on, on uh, virtual boxes, such as Blackmagic cards. Um, anything that is uh, hardware related is getting problematic to test on there. But what you can test, does your configuration management write the things you would expect it to write? Or is there some uh, mistake in there? and these sort of things. Ansible's mani manage any, uh, everything at once. Yes, there's always the risk to screw up everything at once, but uh, you can fix it afterwards, hopefully. Um, uh, version management uh, of the configurations. Keep your configurations uh, as they are. Uh, Ansible has one big advantage. The configurations are reasonably human readable. And you can put comments, so you can actually see what is happening and when you document them immediately and into a version management. Uh, we have used Git to try Git. Uh, I find it a big Git, but uh, that's a different, uh, different thing. Um, and then monitoring. Uh, we will be using a two-stage system uh, the standard monitoring on the OS layer, you name the tools uh, you want to use, doesn't make any difference. You will need them. Um, and then we have the homebrew monitoring. And you will be, that's one of these frightening bi uh, pictures uh, uh, where Stuart uh, uh, goes cringing uh, because of all the offline agents. Yeah, the problem is all these offline agents are currently uh, packed back into the cupboard uh, where in the same boxes they, they came in. Uh, they are just not deployed yet. 
But you can see there is the odd one, uh, which is our previous deployment, uh, where you actually see the screenshot of the Gallicaster. I'm overrunning desperately, badly. Uh, yeah, eight minutes around. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, then I go to my last slide, uh, monitoring what does it do. Uh, yeah, what does this, what do every, does everybody think the shade, uh, state should be and how that does that correlate to, to reality? That's the, basically what the monitoring is for. And uh, acknowledgements, Antoine, Stuart, James, and especially uh, Jaime, who gave us all these tools on, on the hand. Sorry for overrunning that, that, that badly. <laughs> I wasn't that overrunning. <laughs> 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 um.